Let's start our next discipleship class. We're going to talk about the Bible, the Bible. Now, here's the thing, is that concerning your notes, it's mostly going to be based off of Alvin Douglas's book. So that's the good news. So basically, you don't have to be um, writing a lot of notes. Now, I would encourage you to please keep just writing notes. But the notes are going to be based off the book. There are like probably four lessons that I do in this whole discipleship. That's going to be mostly based off the book. So if you bought this book, you're in good shape. If you didn't, uh, I'll be writing it, so write down the notes. Okay, let's talk about the Bible. Uh, if you look at our website, www.bbcenglish.org. Now, I don't want to keep writing this over and over again, folks. So um, I want you to make sure that you know this. Some of you already are saying, well, I already know this, Pastor. Well, there, you'd be surprised how many people don't know yet still. So go to our website, please. In our website, once you go over here, go to the search engine, and in the search engine, type down theological outline. And when you type down theological outline, you're going to find my article. You're going to find my article outline. And it's going to be this ar uh, outline. Bibliology, theology, Christology, pneumatology, anthropology, amartiology, soteriology, Christianology, etc., and etc. So these points in the outline should be showing. So we're going to finish our doctrine of the Bible, bibliology. Okay? So let's finish our study on bibliology tonight. So let's talk about the Bible. The Bible. So let's talk about the Bible today. So the Bible is an amazing book. You should have also read from uh, Dr. Upman's theological studies about um, symbols of the Bible and wonders of the Bible. Those are the two things that you should have looked at. All right, so we're going to look and talk about the doctrine of the Bible. So first of all, let's talk about the seven crowning wonders of the Bible. The first wonder is the wonder of its formation. The wonder of its formation. Now, we already covered production of the Bible. So in production of the Bible, I explained to you a lot of fascinating things about the book. The wonder of its formation. The wonder of its formation. What about its formation, Pastor? Well, uh, rewind if you can so that you can write all this down if you don't get it all down. But basically, it's one book written in one place in one language, another book written in another country centuries later in another language. That's the wonder of its formation. The second wonder of the Bible will be the wonder of its unification. The wonder of its unification. How so, Pastor? Well, in the wonder of its unification, it is a library of 66 books, yet only one book, for it has but one author, the Holy Spirit, and there are no contradictions. It's amazing. 66, yet united. Number three, the wonder of its age. The wonder of its age. How so, Pastor? What is so wonderful about its age? Because, think about it, folks, it is the most ancient of all books. There is no other book in the entire world that is more ancient than the book that you have in your hand right now that you could buy just for 99 cents in a Dollar Tree store. That's got to be something. All right, the wonder of its sale. The wonder of its sale. You know why it's that much of a wonder? It's the best-selling book of all time. Your King James Bibles, literally, literally billions of copies. Billions. That's why Book of Mor the Book of Mormon, they're trying to pass them out like flies. Why? Trying to outcompete. But you can't outcompete the Bible, no matter what book you have. Not even Ro Rowling, with all her Harry Potter books and all her millions of dollars, can outcompete the Bible. The Bible is a fascinating book. The wonder of its interest. The wonder of its interest. Why is it that interesting? Are you kidding me? How many videos have you watched from us already? And you don't think that book is interesting by now? <laughs> Maybe you should test your salvation. Maybe you're not saved. <laughs> Maybe that's the reason why you're getting bored and don't see the interest of the book. The reason why it is the only book that is read by all classes and ages of mankind. Think about that. And it is read by, 
It is read by old men, it is read by children, and it is read by all nations around the world. You gotta realize that, folks. All kinds of different cultures, they take that book and read it. It's that interesting. From Africa to China, through the Pacific Islands and the America. I mean, the Bible is not an American book. That was a, that was a Jewish book. That was a Jewish book written by mostly Jews. The wonder of its language. The wonder of its language. How so? What is so wonderful about the language, preacher? Oh, the wonder of its language. Well, it was written largely by, do you know what kind of men wrote it? Uneducated men. Mostly uneducated men wrote this. Now, don't get me wrong. There were some very brilliant men who were involved, like King Solomon, the physician Luke. But you've got to realize this. Majority were uneducated men who wrote that book. And God considered that as part of his Bible. That's a miraculous thing. And it's considered today to be a literary masterpiece. What? Written by fishermen? And it's considered to be a masterpiece classic? Unfathomable. The wonder of its preservation. Now that's my favorite. The wonder of its preservation. The Bible is the most hated of all books. It is the most hated of all books. There is no other book that is more hated, and it's not the Book of Mormon, it's not the Koran. I'm talking about the King James Bible. And I'm not even talking about the NIV people or the NKJV. I'm talking about the King James Bible. Even Christian churches hate the King James Bible. They try to ridicule KJV, what they call KJV onlyism. But I'm going to tell you something that proves even more that the book that you got in your hand, that King James Bible, is the right book. Because why in the world would there be so many people hating that one particular book? What wrong did that book ever do to them? What wrong did that book ever do to them? Unless there's a spiritual sinister force behind the scene that wants to attack that book out of all the other books he wants to attack. That should be very telling. That should be very telling. Time and time again, kings and governments have sought to burn and abolish the book. The Catholic Church throughout centuries, centuries, have hunted down the Waldensians and many Christians and tried to get the scriptures from their hands. And you've got to realize that the King James Bible, it was not all complete like that, and they were freely able to pr produce copy after copy. No, it was fragments and manuscripts and copies of copies of parts of it that they had to hold it, that they had to preserve, that writers have to write down by hand before the printing press came out. And that book has been preserved. And you're telling me that Bible is not a wonderful book after that. It is a wonder out of all wonders. And think about it now. That Bible can be found in almost every home today in America. Wow. Ain't that something? Ain't that something? All right, now we're going to turn to several verses right here. Let's talk about the symbols of the Bible. Symbols of the Bible. There are seven symbols as well in the Bible. Seven symbols throughout the Bible. The first passage that we will turn to is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. All right, here are basic symbols that you should know. If you don't know these, then you don't know your beginner's Beginner's discipleship. This is a beginner's course. You'd be surprised how many people know about, oh, who the Nephilim are and, you know, who's the top elite ladder and then how it all works about the centrifugal forces of the universe and the earth and then blah, 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 blah. And they won't know verses about seven symbols of the Bible. That's amazing. Some of these people, they'll accuse me of being a person still sucking on my milk because there are deep doctrines that I refuse to cover yet because they're very abstract and they're all over online. And those prideful people will say how much they know about that and that I'm drinking milk, but those people don't even know their own milk. Seven symbols of the Bible. All right, that's a rebuke. Why am I rebuking about this? Because I'm telling you that these seven symbols, this should be something you should know rather than jumping through something online and then getting lost in a rabbit hole with all this kind of stuff that's not going to benefit anything at the judgment seat of Christ. But these seven symbols of the Bible, they're going to be a benefit to you. It's a sword. Look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. 
One of the verses that is very popular and you should be memorizing. For the word of God, it's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So notice right here, it's a two-edged sword. It can cut you. Now notice this is two-edged. Why? Because the sword can be for you and it can even be against you. How many times have people have tried to use the Bible to promote their own fleshy beliefs and that sword has cut them? They cut themselves with that sword. Rather than the sword being a benefit for them, it cut them. So it's a two-edged sword. It can either be for you where it attacks your enemies or it can be against you where you can injure yourself. Another thing is that it's a hammer. It's a hammer. Go to the book of Jeremiah, please. Jeremiah. We're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 29. Jeremiah chapter 23. And we will read verse 29. The word of God is a hammer. You can't mess with that book, man. That book will smash you to pieces. Go to the book of Jeremiah. And we'll look at chapter 23. And then we'll read verse 29, chapter 23. And we will read verse 29 of Jeremiah. So notice right here what the Word of God says right here about the Bible. It is a hammer. Notice, is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. So notice right here that the Word of God, it can smash you all over the floor. No one can mess with that book. All right, we're also going to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, please, and we'll look at verse 23. 1 Peter chapter 1, and we will read verse 23. The Word of God is also likened to a seed. It is a seed because it is able to produce life and vegetation and grow in your life. That's right. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God. So notice right here, it's born of incorruptible seed. That should be the Bible. Which liveth and abideth forever. Let's also look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. The word of God is not only likened to seed, but it is also likened to a mirror. A mirror. Why a mirror, Pastor? Oh, I'll tell you why. Because there's a lot of gunk in you that you never saw before. Amen. How many people have looked themselves up in the mirror and realized how dirty they are? Yeah. Sometimes people don't even know how yellow their teeth looks like until they look at the mirror. Yeah. But then that Word of God, what it does is that because it's a mirror, it's going to show you all the yellow stuff that you ignored. I mean, I'm telling you something, folks. When you started watching us online, when you started coming to our church, when you started reading that book, didn't you realize that uh, there were a lot of things that you didn't know about? And then when you started to hear more and more and more, compare yourself from one year ago. Didn't you look very different back then? And I mean spiritually speaking. Your attitude, everything, I mean, it's so different from one year ago. So I guarantee you this, you look at yourself in a mirror now without looking at the Bible. Without looking at the Bible, studying the Bible, growing in the Bible, you look at yourself in the mirror right now. Okay? Once you start looking at yourself in the mirror now, then give it one year. One year, study the Bible, memorize the Bible, and then let the preaching of the Bible sink in inside you. And what's going to happen one year later when you look at yourself in the mirror? You're going to go, wow, I look totally different. I look more clean. And if you were to look at yourself one year ago on how you looked like in the mirror, you're going to go, did I really look that filthy? I didn't know I was that bad. But not only that, even right now, you don't realize how wicked you are until you hear the preaching of the Word of God. And then like a light bulb, it, it just clicks on your head and you realize, wow, I didn't realize that how rotten I really was. That's what the Word of God does, folks. It's like a mirror. It shows all the defects that you overlooked. I hope you got that. Basically, it shows you all the defects that you overlooked. 
because you think that you got it all cleaned up with your brushing teeth, with your hair, with your dressing, and then until you look at the mirror, oops, there was a spot that you missed. There was a spot that you missed. All right, we're going to look at James chapter 1 and verse 23. The Word of God says, For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Notice right here, in verse 23, if you're a hearer but not a doer of the word, of the word, then what is that? You're looking at yourself in a glass and you look at your natural face. And you're not doing anything with the glass. Okay, so let's also turn to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. And then Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah chapter 20. So Jeremiah 23. And Jeremiah chapter 20. All right. We're going to look at another case right here. It is fire. That word of God, don't burn your heart. I think there's something wrong with you. I'll tell you what, even lost people feel it. I mean, when that preaching gets at them on the streets, oh, they don't like that verse. They get under conviction. They hate it when their sin is preached against. It's a fire, Jeremiah chapter 23. And then we're going to look at verse 29. And we saw that verse before. But did you notice the second half? All right, let's start off with Jeremiah 23. Then we'll jump to chapter 20. Notice the word of God says, Is not my word like as a what? Fire. It burns. Now go to Jeremiah chapter 20. And we will read verse 9. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. I don't know about you folks, but when I get tired and bogged down and I just probably might say, you know, I just don't feel like shouting. I just don't feel like praising the Lord. I don't feel like so winning. But man, when I hear that word of God being preached, you can't shut me up after that. When I hear that word of God, I'm just going to jump out of my seat. And I, I'm going to go, I can't take it anymore. I can't stay backslidden anymore. I can't be quiet anymore. That's what happened with Jeremiah. He said, I will not make mention of the name of the Lord. But he wasn't soon long to last to be silent because that word of God just kept burning and he just felt like preaching. I'll tell you what, man. There are times that in my own weakness and in my flesh, I felt like quitting the ministry quitting on preaching and teaching. But then I just told myself, can you imagine, man, that for one month you don't preach? <laughs> can you imagine if for six months you haven't preached or taught something? How would you feel? And I go, man, I can't imagine life like that. I got to preach. I got to teach because that word burns in my heart. You try not street preaching for one month. Let's try doing that, huh? You probably say, Pastor, I can't wait anymore. I'm going to preach out on the streets by myself if you're not going to do it. <laughs> All right, let's also turn to Psalms chapter 119 and verse 105. Psalms chapter 119, and we'll look at verse 105. Another thing that the Bible is likened to is that it is likened to a lamp. It is likened to a lamp. Turn to Psalms chapter 119 and verse 105. Very good verse. It says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So notice that the Bible, it symbolizes a lamp because it guides you in every step that you go. That way you don't bump across the darkness, get yourself hurt and into trouble. So that word of God is a lamp that guides every step in your path. Let's also look at 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. The Bible is also likened to milk. It is likened to milk. We're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 2, and we will read verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. So we're going to see right here that it is also likened to food. So we see an example right here how it's likened to food. It's milk. It's milk. I'm going to tell you something, folks. There's a lot of people who are spiritually malnourished. 
Can I add this too? You can watch as many stuff as you can on YouTube and on the internet, and you are starving to death. You are spiritually malnourished. You might say, why do you say that? You might say that out of arrogance and pride. Because let me ask you this. When's the last time you went through that Bible at least one time? Did you ever go through that Bible yet? And you know all this stuff about Nephilim, flat earth, aliens, UFOs, uh, pyramid ladder, and then Mandela effect, yada, yada, yada. And you know Bible you think after that? That's not Bible, folks. When's the last time you went through that book even one time? Who's the one being spiritually a babe? See? God, he wants you to get off that internet and get you into the word. He wants you to do that. Now, don't get me wrong. The internet has done a lot of good in getting uh, some of you getting saved, some of you converted to Bible-believing truth, and even knowing about the Bible. But here's the thing. Now that it opened the door for you to know about the Bible, you got to get into the Bible now. Now you got to spend time off of the internet and get your nose in the book. Don't look at Facebook. Get your face in that book. Amen. That's what it should be. All right. We're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. Uh, not only that, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 through 14. Hebrews 5, 12 through 14 shows that these people, they have to be growing in their milk. And you'll also see in the Bible that it can be likened to meat as well. So it's food. It's food. Your Bible is symbolized as food. So Alvin Douglas, he writes here, the word of God convicts, breaks, regenerates, reveals, consumes, illuminates, and nourishes the individual. How so? Because it goes through all those seven symbols. That's why. It convicts. Uh, let's see right here. It convicts. It breaks, it regenerates, it reveals, it consumes, it illuminates, and it nourishes the individual. How appropriate is our Bible? How appropriate is our Word of God? Okay, so let's look at seven reasons for preaching the Word of God. Okay, I might go on a little sermon spree right here. All right, seven reasons why you should preach on the Word of God. Well, why should I preach on the Word of God? Well, I'm going to tell you something why you should preach on that Word of God. Because one, you would have gotten saved had it not been for that book. Two, you wouldn't know that Christianity is real. You wouldn't have any evidence of Christianity if it weren't for that book. Why can you believe that the Quran, uh, Islam, Hinduism, Catholicism, Mormonism, evolution, atheism, all of those beliefs are wrong. Not only that, how can you tell that Christian churches are not deceiving you with wrong doctrine? There's so many Christian churches, but they teach wrong doctrine. How can you tell without the Word of God? The Word of God is one of the most important things in your life. It is very important that you have that book because that book is going to help you so many times that's why it is very salient to preach on the Word of God. That book is that important. It saved your soul. It saved your life. It is the evidence of our faith and your faith. Okay, so let's cover these seven reasons why we should preach the Word of God. So let's first turn to Mark chapter 2 and verse 2, shall we? So let's first turn to Mark chapter 2 and verse 2. Let's talk about seven reasons why we preach the Word of God. I'm sure you can think of so many reasons already without me mentioning it. Let's look at seven reasons. First of all, you've got to realize that Jesus faced the multitude and made a tremendous decision. And you know what his decision was? It was to preach the Word of God. That's how much Jesus realized it was important. Look at Mark chapter 2, and we will read verse 2. As soon as, whoa, my fingers are slippery here. Let's jump over here. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. So you'll notice right here there were so many people cramming in, they're about to cram in, and then what did Jesus do? He preached the word unto them. 
It's that important. It's that important because when you face the multitude and you get so many people around you, how can you shut your mouth and not preach a verse on the street? How can you shut your mouth when there are so many people parading with their billboard signs, with their street signs, proclaiming their quote-unquote equal rights, their feminist movement, their homosexuality movement, gay pride parade, yada, 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 and who to vote for the presidency. And we got Christians who just shut their mouth when they see that multitude. But Jesus Christ, he couldn't keep his mouth shut when he saw the multitude. He preached the word of God. I can't help it, folks. You can't stop me when I'm on that street corner. I'm going to preach that word of God when I see that multitude. Also going to go to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. We are sent not to preach a new church, but Christ as he is revealed in the Bible. We, on, we insist on preaching the Bible. How so? Because it endures for time and eternity. That book's the most important thing in your life. That's why it's very important that when you street preach, you should preach the Bible. You should preach verses. You can't just uh, pull up clever gist and however way you want that can persuade people. You got to preach that word. That Bible is the thing that lasts for all time and eternity, not human logical reasoning. That's why it's very important for you that when you street preach, quote verses. I really believe in quoting verses when you preach, not pulling up gimmicks and then doing shock tactics, acting like a jerk. Now, don't get me wrong. There are people who don't understand the verses that you're saying, so you're going to have to explain it to them. But here's the thing. How can you explain it to them without the authority? You can't explain something, convince some, someone without an authoritative source. Well, how, if I taught you just everything that I had in my own knowledge, but I didn't show you a single verse, how can you believe me? See, that I'm without authority. Professors, even when they teach at school, how can they yada yada spit out everything in their mouth without documented authoritative sources? That's why it's important when you street preach. Quote a verse. Quote a verse. You need authority to back you up. And then after that, you, got, you quoted the authority. You explain the people what the authority said, not what you said. That's how it works in street preaching. The grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. See that? Grass is likened to human nature. So human nature, with all your human wordings, it just fades away and withers. It dies. But the Word of God, it endures forever. So don't use human logic and reasoning when you preach. Use the Word of God, folks. All right, conviction of sins comes through the preaching of the Word of God. Go to Acts chapter 2, verse 14 through 37. Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 37. You got to understand, folks, that conviction of sins comes through the preaching of the Word of God. All right, so since this is quite a passage, I'm not going to read everything right here. But reason number one, conviction of sin. How can you convict people of sin? Tell them it's wrong if you don't have the Bible to tell them that it's wrong. Everybody's saying, you're wrong about this, you're wrong about that. These liberals are pointing their fingers at you saying, don't judge me, you don't have the right to judge. They're right. Guess what? They're right. I don't have the right to judge them. But that book has the right to judge them. Amen. And when I quote that book, that book has every right to judge them. And they have no right to judge that book on when it convicts their sin. Let's look at that. Uh, well, you won't turn over there, but you'll notice from verses 14 through 37. Peter, when he preached uh, his sermon, he quoted nine verses. Uh, out of 23 are quotations from the Old Testament. And when he was uh, quoting these verses in, the, in Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 37, nine of them were from the Old Testament. And you know what the Bible says at the very end of those verses? The people's hearts were pricked. If the very first start of the church required the Word of God to be preached, you better preach with the Word of God too. Let's look at Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Rom Romans chapter 10, verse 17. You know why? It's a requirement of our faith. How can we have evidence that what we believe in is right 
if we don't have evidence. You know why I believe? Here, let me tell you something. You know why I can even believe something weird like UFO, something crazy like UFO? How can you say that? Well, there are pictures, there are videos, and there are eyewitnesses, stuff like that. Hey, man, you can go back and forth with the scientific community, too. There are scientists who, who do, who can support this UFO stuff, believe it or not, there are. But you know what scientific community is if you study science? They argue back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Hey, how do you know Jesus is God? That can be made up, like the liberal said, from people throughout the centuries. And they just deified Jesus when Jesus was merely a man and he didn't intend to say that he is God. I mean, the Muslims even said, where did Jesus declare himself to be God? Show me a verse. He did not specifically say he is God. How can you believe that without the word of God? The Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, the Bible says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the what? Word of God. All right, not only that, it's your cleansing. It's your cleansing. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and we will read verse 1. Notice right here that the word of God is required because it cleans you up. You know what can clean you up right now? You, that word of God. It washes you. You might say, how so? What do you mean, how so? It shows me you probably didn't read your Bible. <laughs> When's the last time that you set aside your day, stopped with your sin and the dirty stuff you're watching on television and in your ear right now with that music? When's the last time that you stopped when you started to get away from the filthiness of the world? the society and the people around you who take the name of God in vain and just went in a solitary place and opened that book and spent, and I guarantee you this, you can't go more than 30 minutes without reading that Bible and you feel like things are getting filtered out. Amen. You're feeling like the gunk is getting cleaned off finally. That your mind is finally getting some kind of cleanup. It's that word of God, man. So in Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Notice this is having therefore these promises. Based on these promises, the filthiness of our flesh is cleansed up. And why are those promises? Those promises are found by the word of God. But uh, not only that, you'll also realize that the Bible says that at the book of John, uh, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Ephesians chapter 5, uh, sanctifying themselves with the washing of the water by the word. By the word. The, wa the word of God cleans you up. All right, assurance also comes from the word of God. Assurance. That word of God assures you, you are saved. Well, how do I know I'm saved? Because the Bible says so. The Bible says so. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. I'm just going to read it. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Uh, the Bible shows also that it's comfort. It's comfort. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 18. The Bible says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words words with these words the word of god gives you comfort truth also comes from the word of god truth also comes from the word of god that can be found at acts chapter 17 and verse 11 acts chapter 17 and verse 11 the word of god reads right here i'll just read it these were more noble than those in thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so see they were testing the truth of it the new birth, that's how you got saved. I think that's the most important thing, is that it saved your soul from hell. The new birth. That's why it's important to preach from the Word of God. That's founded at the book of 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. And we read that verse before. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Seven reasons why some do not read the Word of God. Oh, can you think of more than seven, probably? Yeah, yeah. All right, let's base this off of Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 16. Do not read the Bible. Why do people, seven, read, seven reasons why people do not read the Word of God. Jeremiah 
chapter 15 and verse 16. It is the wickedness and the ignorance of people. That's what you got to realize. We live in a day of a wicked age. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. So you'll notice right here that the Bible should be something that we should find, we should eat. It should be the joy and rejoicing. But the world's reaction to this is the total opposite. And it's one, ignorant of its truth. One is that they are ignorant of its truths. What these people who are going to hell do is that they ignore Genesis 1-1. God created the whole world. They think that evolution created it. Uh, they do not believe it when Jesus said, I'm the only way to heaven. They're ignorant of its truth. And this even includes some of the people watching online, even the deep doctrines like UFOs. You know why people don't believe in UFOs? They don't believe that book, ignorant of its truth. Why don't people believe in dispensationalism? Ignorant of its truth. See, all of that is based on the Bible. Another thing is that it's already eaten. Feeding on ashes. It's already eaten. It's feeding on ashes. You might say, what do you mean by that, preacher? Well, the Bible shows that in Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 20, that it shows right here that there are people who are feeding on the wrong kind of things. They feed on ashes, feed on things that give them a stomach ache, something that's corruptible, something that is totally messed up and bogus. They're feeding on politics today. How many times have they watched CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, and all that kind of stuff? How many of them have been feeding on comic after comic? And how many people have been feeding on online, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter? Can I go on and on and on? They're feeding on the ashes, and they're not feeding on the Word of God. Another thing is sickness. Another thing is sickness. That's uh, another reason why people do not read the Word of God. I'm too sick, so I can't read the Bible. No, that's not what I meant. A sin-sick soul has no appetite for the Word of God. Have you ever seen a sick person being hungry to eat? A sin-sick person has no appetite for the Word of God. How many sick people we have walking in our world, especially in San Francisco Bay Area? Amen. Bunch of sick people yep. condoning this all kind of liberal nonsense, is religious toleration, and rainbow, sexual identity, yada, yada, yada. Sick people. See, they have no appetite for the Word of God. Not only that, they're lunching between meals. See, that's why it shows they're not hungry. That's why they, they have no hunger for the Word of God. They're living in the light, frivolous, non-essential things in life. That's why they have no hunger of the Word of God. They're satiating their hunger on the things of this world. You try eating a lot of chocolate and candy. See if you can be hungry after that. And eating a lot of that chocolate and candy is not good for your health either. Amen. That's what this world is doing. Mm -hmm. Not only that, the book lacks flavor. Yep, that's right. It doesn't suit your taste, bud. You don't like it when the Bible says that homosexuality is an abomination. You don't like it when the Bible says, rightly dividing the word of truth, that there is dispensationalism. You anti-Semites don't like it when the Bible says that God has preserved his nation of Israel, and I mean physical Jews. You don't like it when the Bible talks about a Genesis gap or even deep doctrines like UFOs. We can go on. All right, I'm not, I'm not trying to split the body of Christ, all right? Don't get mad at me, please. But this is just something where you got to understand. Sometimes people, the reason why they don't, uh, they don't agree with the doctrine you teach is because it doesn't suit their flavor. That's, right. That's ultimately one thing I realized when talking to people. Not because they believe in the Bible. I mean, they do. But the thing is, is that they don't trust in every word right. in the right doctrine because it doesn't, when it comes to not suiting their taste bud, then they're going to disagree that part of the Bible That's good. And, think it, and think it goes to a different interpretation. All right. Uh, the book is too sweet. The book is too sweet. Some. You might say, well, how is it too sweet? Well, the Word of God actually can show that. In Revelation chapter 10, verse 8 through 10, the book was sweet as honey in the mouth. And you got to realize that some people think that the Bible is only for uh, the sick, the aged, and the dying. 
Too sweet and sentimental for practical, healthy people. See? Rich people say, no, I don't need the Bible. Right. I, I already got it made. You know, that book is a crutch. It's a sweet thing for people who, who need it, but not me. You know, I'm too good for the book. But those people, like atheists would say, what about Christianity and the Bible? It's like a crutch. It's like a sweet thing that appeases the mind of frivolous, weak-minded individuals, they'll say. See, too proud, too arrogant. The book is not only too sweet, but it's too bitter. <laughs> it's too bitter. You've got to realize that. I mean, there's something in that book that just makes you feel uh, in the middle of street preaching. Yeah, that's right. In the middle of when pastor preaches something from the Bible. Did, did, did you ever sense that uh, feeling before? That uh feeling? Yeah. That's why people don't come, back, don't come back to our church. You know why? Our restaurant serves bitter food, so we always chase away people. Yeah, yeah, right. But Joel Osteen's church always gives out free candy for everybody. And I mean literally, too. They just give out free candy. <laughs> See, that's the thing. Now, there are seven points you should remember in uh, reading the Bible. So I'm not going to write them down, but I want you to write these stuff down if you don't have it. Uh, the paper sheet for it. If you do have the book, then you can look through it. But there are seven points to remember when you read the Bible. You got to read it lovingly. Why? Because the Bible is the word of my Savior to me. If you had a boyfriend or if you had a girlfriend or if you have a wife, you have a husband who truly loved and cared for you, and the only way they can communicate is through that uh, letter that they wrote oh, to you. Yeah, How would you treat that letter? Yes. Yeah. And, and where's your love letter? Oh, I'll tell you where it's been. It's right underneath your TV Guide magazine. It's underneath your computer screen. Your computer screen is elevated above the Word of God. That's more often on your desk than the Bible. See, you watch too much YouTube. I'm not kidding you. You watch too much YouTube. You look too much of Facebook, man. You look too much of that stuff. Read it reverently. You got to realize that this book is a holy book. It's not something that you should leave it on, a, on the mat of your doorstep. You should drop it on the ground. Oh, it's just a book. Some book, man. Do you know how much blood was shed for it? Do you know how many millions of dollars this book should cost through manuscript evidence? You got to free for your hand, man. You don't treat that book with reverence. I mean, don't you treat the name of Jesus with reverence that you could get stoned to death? Isn't his word magnified above his own name? And you don't think that you should treat that book reverently. Read it prayerfully. Read it prayerfully. Why should you read it prayerfully? The Bible is God's message to me, to my own heart and life. That's why when I read it, it's the same thing that I'm talking to God at the same time. Read it meditatively. You've got to meditate on the word of God. Be like Isaac at the old time in the Bible who just meditated on the Word of God. And I'm not talking about yoga, where they're focusing on some kind of image or a shoelace or something like that, or emptying themselves till they focus on one particular thing. You know what God wants you to meditate? He wants you to focus on every single word in that book. Amen, amen. Because your mind always wanders because it's a television, it's a stupid, moronic television mind where you need a screen to always flip Five seconds, the pixel's going super fast, and you need it HD quality. That's right. that, is the, that is the mindset of wicked people today, man. You gotta, you gotta be focusing on that word. Why are you preaching so hard, Pastor? Because I'm living in that TV millennial generation, and I know the kind of fleshy feeling that I can be prone to go through. So when I'm preaching, I'm preaching at myself too. Read it systematically. Why? Read right through the Bible, not just selected portions. A lot of people just pick and choose. You got to read it through, read it through, because sometimes that word can speak to you rather than you deliberately finding the word to speak to you. Another thing is that you got to read it resolutely, resolutely. In other words, you got to obey it to the fullest and be resolved when you read that word. Read it daily, read it daily. And I like what the author wrote right here. Not just on Sundays, but every day of your life, read a portion. <laughs> yeah, boy, folks. When's the last time you read your Bible? And please don't say Sunday church service. Please don't say right now. Read it daily. 
All right, your homework assignment, we're going to be covering theology. I will be posting your homework assignment online. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the truth of thy word. Dismiss us now with your blessing. Bless the next service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great, then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.